Well, welcome to this uh, Bon Solon video for expert witnesses. Uh, you've probably read that the Civil Justice Council has published the guidance for the instruction of experts to give evidence in civil claims 2012. And the stated purpose of this guidance is to assist litigants, those instructing experts and experts in understanding latest is best practice with regard to compliance with Part 35 of the Civil Procedure Rules and its overriding objective. It replaces the current protocol. The rewrite was undertaken by a working party chaired by a distinguished guest, guest uh, John Pickering. Well, welcome, John. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm the uh, chief executive of Erwin Mitchell Solicitors. Uh, uh, I'm a litigator by background, uh, specialising in personal injury and uh, clinical negligence cases. And as you know, I sit on the Civil Justice Council. So you must have worked with many experts in your time. A lot in the years, yes. Um, why did the council decide to revise the guidance and bring out this new guidance? The, uh, the old protocol was just that. It was getting yes. a bit old and it was felt that it needed bringing up to date uh, we needed just to check that it was relevant in terms of current case law and uh, it, need, it needed a refresh. Right. And what would you say were the main changes of this? They're not huge, but what we've tried to do is make it uh, much more user-friendly. So you'll see that the uh, format of the guidance uh, is such that it's aimed at those who are instructing experts, predominantly solicitors obviously, mm. Uh, but also then at experts, what's their perspective, how should they engage in this area. And then there are some general points which uh, sweep up at the end. So it's a bit more focused in terms of how it's organised. Well, I must say it's, it, it seems much easier to read than the last uh, yeah. documentation and I, I would encourage our experts to read it themselves. Um, it, it encourages a lot more uh, uh, careful instruction of experts, I would say. Um, can you perhaps tell us what the guidance is on the appointment of experts? Yes, much of it is common sense, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Um, clearly, the starting point is to make sure that you identify the right expert. So someone sure. who has got the requisite expertise and experience to assist you with the particular issue. Uh, and then thereafter, it's just making sure that you can agree suitable terms, that they are available for you, that they can report within your time frames and that they can make themselves available if required to attend court. I noticed you missed the word fees there and that's obviously a very hot topic for experts. Um, I think there are some uh, powers now to limit the fees and to get estimates of fees. Do you want to expand a little on that? Well, I think the starting point is that uh, the question of fees is really still a matter of contract as between expert and those instructing the expert. Mm. Uh, but of course the issues become what is recoverable in, in, mo in most of the litigation that we deal with, particularly personal injury, uh, then th there are limits that are going to be imposed by the courts, by legal aid people and so on, as to the uh, fees that can be recovered. Uh, into parties for experts and in turn those instructing experts are mindful of them and effectively don't want to be in a posi position where an expert is charging more than those sorts of guidelines. Sure. And I suppose this uh, complies with the Jackson reforms, makes more compliant with that. Yes it does, that's right. <clears throat> now experts often report that they have to amend their reports, uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, that is frequently the case. Uh, in many situations, particularly the more complicated cases, say clinical negligence cases, um, th things can evolve. M new evidence can emerge, uh, new witness material might uh, be presented, uh, therefore it becomes necessary for an expert to revisit their opinion and, if appropriate, make amendments. And the question is therefore one of uh, scale. Is it a minor amendment? which might just be a quick note uh, and not requiring of uh, something that demands a substantial rewrite of the report, mm -hmm. or is it something more fundamental than that? I suppose the, point, the end point is to make sure that there is produced a document which at the end of the day is going to meet the Part 35 requirement and be useful in court. Sure. It seems the whole... Uh, thrust of the rules is trying to narrow the issues between experts and obviously discussions play a major part in that. Are there any changes regarding discussions in these new 
No, there was nothing that's changed vis a vis uh, discussions. But what we have tried to do is to make sure that people really just do apply their minds to what is involved in, in experts' meetings. Mm. And so there is uh, guidance there about preparation, about how the meeting should be conducted, the desirability of producing a note uh, early after the meeting has taken place, and so on. Uh, as you rightly say, uh, the purpose of the meeting is really to see the extent to which issues can be narrowed, therefore the extent to which there is agreement on particular issues, and also where the areas of disagreement might be. Sure. Uh, so that come the case uh, going to court, the court has a clear understanding of where the real uh, territory is that needs to be explored. And I think there's also some guidance about solicitors trying to stop experts actually come to some sort of agreement, and that has to be explicit in the report, is that correct? It does, that's right. Um, the idea is essentially that solicitors should not interfere with the process. Sure. Uh, clearly there might be times when uh, say a solicitor is in a meeting uh, and the experts might require guidance on a particular point, a particular sure. point of law. Well, fair enough. But what a solicitor shouldn't really seek to do is to intervene with the expert's process of expressing an objective professional opinion. And so there are gradations, therefore, that come into play in that, uh, at that point. Mm. And perhaps you'd be kind enough to explain uh, the difference between experts instructed prior to the commencement of litigation and those instructed after the commencement of litigation and the guidance there? The, um, the guidance is essentially aimed at those experts that have been instructed for the purposes of litigation. Sure. Uh, and by that in, in, I mean those who are potentially uh, instructed when the court has made an order permitting the instruction of experts or indeed the court has specifically asked for an experts report. Mm -hmm. So those are, the guidance is aimed at those experts that are really going to be engaged in the litigation process and may ultimately have to appear in court. Sure. However, it is the case that there are a number of situations where solicitors might literally just go to an expert to seek preliminary advice, sure. not intending then to instruct that expert uh, subsequently in the context of any court uh, mm -hmm. litigation. Uh, in, in the case of, in that case, that's the expert, I, I, sorry, the expert acting in a purely advisory capacity, but the implications of part 35 are not really present no. in the former uh, area, which is what guidance is aimed at, then all the part 35 obligations are very much to the fore. Well, we've all heard about Jones and Caney and uh, liability and contracts and negligence for mm. expert witnesses. How has that impacted your thinking in the committee in terms of this guidance? Well, the Jones and Caney case, we effectively uh, sought to remove the, if you like, the indemnity that existed or the protection, the immunity that existed for experts giving evidence in court. So there is the potential risk of an expert being found to be negligent in terms of the way they give their evidence in court. So that is opened up now. And therefore the guidance was really trying to get experts properly to think about what their obligations are uh, to deliver an objective opinion. And if they follow the guidance and behave in that way, then they should mitigate completely the risk of uh, being negligent and being at risk. Sure. Uh, Asking for directions, this was allowed in under the original rules. Mm. Is there any change in that? No, the gu what the guidance has not done is in any way changed the rules. No. So the rules, uh, i.e. Uh, part 35 and the practice direction, they have, have not been altered. Mm. But what the guidance is trying to do is to just to make, put that in a, in a current context. So in terms of being experts being able to go to the court to ask a judge, say, for guidance, uh, that is still permissible, uh, that can happen. Clearly, one needs to be sensible about how that might operate. The, the first port of call for an is expert the is their own solicitor. Sure. And if, if the solicitor resolves it, then so be it. It's, it's only in the last resort where an expert really is in difficulty. They have the ability to be able to go to a court and say, I need some help here, uh, maybe to get access to evidence or, or whatever. Sure. Uh, the cornerstone of much of the experts' work is obviously the report. Is there any further guidance on report writing? Uh, the report, writing of the report, no. Um, the content of the report 
is set out in the guidance, um, but the fundamentals are still there. And I suppose that is a hark back to the elder carrier and reefer principles, making sure that one's um, being um, properly briefed, that the uh, nature of the instructions are clear, and that one has then applying a proper objective standard to the preparation of an opinion, utilising the uh, relevant material and also the latest thinking in terms of, um, say, um, medical advancements or whatever it may be. I think there is now a duty on the expert to ensure the clarity of instructions, so I think it is important the experts do read this guidance, isn't it? Very much so. I, I, if one is going to engage in this arena, um, then it, you know, that's, that's a very serious point. Sure. Um, it's a serious point for the expert in terms of their professional integrity and how they want to be perceived uh, operating in that space. It's crucially important for the client whose uh, solicitor is instructing them. So this is not an area to be taken lightly and therefore uh, the more that a, uh, an expert can do to engage and really understand what, the, uh, what their remit is, uh, the better. And of course they now have to uh, state in their report that they do understand the rules. Absolutely right. Um, going back to the exciting subject of fees and contingency fees, um, Jackson's obviously saying that much civil litigation can be done on a contingency fee basis. I think the guidance says only in exceptional cases can experts work in that way. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, this is uh, the reason that that is there is because of the a court of appeal authority, which uh, essentially uh, countenances the the uh, potential for a situation to arise when an expert might be instructed on a contingent basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the simple legal point is that there is no actual bar to an expert being instructed on a contingent basis. However, um, the strong view expressed by the working party that I was involved with and subsequently by the council mm -hmm. was that that was um, a set of circumstances that we found difficult to envisage uh, because uh, self-evidently the expert that is working on a contingent basis has a, a vested, vested interest in yeah. the outcome of the case. Mm -hmm. And that's felt to be a, a rather undesirable position when essentially the function of the expert is there to give objective evidence and not in the, to be partisan as such. But the, there is a chink in the door? There's a chink in the door. I, I struggle to conceive of the case where that is likely to, be ha to happen, or indeed where the expert, uh, his or herself, would feel comfortable... Um, Working on that with, basis? On that basis. They would be exposed to potentially quite intense cross-examination. Single joint experts, anything new for them? The, I think the, the new thing in this area is the sheer prevalence of the uh, use of single joint experts, particularly in small claims, uh, particularly in fast track. And of course one now has uh, the uh, growth of the size of the fast track, one also has uh, the development of the, uh, the portal for uh, the Ministry of Justice portal in road traffic accident cases and the potential for that to extend into employers' liability oh, yeah, and public yes. liability. So. I think it's not so much the, um, the rules of engagement for single joint experts, it's more about uh, this becoming a much more common feature of the uh, legal landscape. Sure. Uh, sanctions, that, should this worry experts? We put in a bit about sanctions because the previous protocol and indeed other areas have been relatively silent about sanctions. Sanctions exist. Oh, really? and, uh, uh, they are there uh, uh, and they can take broadly two forms. Uh, the uh, expert could be uh, sanctioned by their own professional body if they misbehave, sure. uh, but also they could be sanctioned by a court in extremis. So uh, the expert that gives um, uh, or commits perjury, for example, could potentially face criminal sanction. Uh, th some of this is extreme, but the, the ability to sanction in costs exists. It's just a matter of interest. Do you think the professional bodies are ready up with what's going on? Do you think they need to know that experts are potentially in the frame here? I think all the professional bodies ought to be aware of this guidance uh, and ought to make sure that um, their members that contemplate giving expert evidence are briefed about that. I don't think that um, experts should be deterred by the fact that there is 
uh, the potential for sanction. It, we put it in the guidance really just to complete the picture sure. and just to make sure that people take this very seriously. We haven't put it in to deter people at all. So is this the end of the amateur expert? Have experts now got to be professional, know their law and procedure, know their protocols, etc.? That's a very good question. Um, I don't think one is looking for um, the expert to be effectively two experts, i.e. Sure. in their own expertise and a lawyer as well. Sure. Uh, that's not where we're going. But what we are saying is, um, think about this seriously. You are engaging in a, a very serious area. This is something where you need to be very mindful of your professional obligations and apply professional standards. If you do that, then you'll negotiate that safely, comfortably, even if you are a first-time expert, mm. uh, unfamiliar with the uh, with the scene. And any further thoughts for our experts? <laughs> well, from a practitioner with a lot of experience in, say, the clinical negligence field, um, I would encourage experts to engage um, for two reasons, actually. The first is um, that there is a need for good experts, competent professionals, mm. to express opinions in, in many cases. And actually, in a number of uh, areas, it is difficult to get hold of people who will uh, give opinions. Mm. Mm. So there is a shortage in some areas. But the second reason is, um, from the expert's point of view, uh, and many experts have said this to me, um, it is a good discipline. It makes you apply your own mind to your practice, it makes you think about what you're doing and how you work mm. in your own environment, and that's a healthy thing. Mm. Well, John, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.